Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. The war in Ukraine is prompting the EU to reform its energy market, diversify its supplies and promote energy efficiency as well as renewables. My guest today is a significant player in that transition away from Russian oil and gas. Kadri Simpson is the EU Commissioner for Energy. She was Minister of Economic Affairs and Infrastructure in the Estonian government and a member of parliament for the Estonian Centre Party. She joins me from Brussels. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner Simpson, for being my guest today. I'd like to start with your recent trip to uh, Ukraine. Uh, you pledged support for the country's energy infrastructure, which has been damaged in repeated attacks. Um, you've said that there's a problem of spare parts and of storage. Maybe you could elaborate on all that for our viewers. I was visiting Kiev on uh, 1st of uh, November, and this was a day after the missile attacks where Russians um, targeted civil infrastructure, transmission lines, um, co-generation plants, um, district heating plants, electricity plants, and as a result, um, big share of uh, um, electricity infrastructure is damaged. And indeed, uh, Ukrainian engineers, they do their best uh, to restore if uh, the plants are at that um, stage that you can restore the uh, transmission or substations, for example. But um, there is also damage done where restoration is not possible no repair is uh, possible, and there they need specific equipment. Uh, equipment uh, that is, um, um, well, not very um, common for Western Europe. Um, only a couple of um, international companies are producing these kind of substations. Um, there are dozens of companies who might have these substations in their storage. And that means uh, that um, European Commission, together with um, European uh, energy community has set up a dedicated fund so that we can transport these specific uh, machineries and uh, devices uh, exactly to these uh, locations in Ukraine where they are most needed. Right now there are millions of uh, households without electricity, without heat before the winter actually arrives. So a, a special fund being set up. I'd like to talk about uh, a, a very topical issue inside the EU. Uh, this is the question of gas price caps. It's something that you've argued for. You've said a, a cap would be uh, necessary and desirable. Um, how are the negotiations going on that in the EU? And do you sense that things are moving towards a cap being in place this winter? The European Commission um, presented a plan and right now national um, energy ministers are discussing um, their position on that. And this is a, um, a um, price, dynamic price cap for the Dutch benchmark, TTF. Uh, most of the spot market transactions are um, well traded against this benchmark and also many long-term contracts are indexed against Dutch TTF. And um, if we will receive mandate from national ministers, then we will uh, set up a benchmark, um, a benchmark cap that we can um, activate uh, when the prices are excessively high. Mm. Right now, of course, since August, the gas market price has come down and we are in the situation where our underground gas storage is full um, we have been able to uh, attract alternative gas supplies from uh, trusted partners to replace Russian uh, lost volumes. And on top of that, um, national ministers in the middle of the summer in July agreed that we will also um, consume less natural gas. And um, in September, as a result, uh, our overall natural gas consumption was down by 15%. All these steps have already um, helped us to target this uh, very difficult situation of extremely volatile and high energy prices. But uh, indeed, uh, this winter will be difficult. And for that reason, um, this price cap for um, 
so, so online an, um, trading platform is necessary. An, an important detail, you're talking about uh, a dynamic uh, cap. So does that mean it can go up at certain points and then come down again? And in the moments when it goes up, does that mean that the price for consumers also goes up in the same period, if it's a fluctuating cap? There are indeed uh, some very uh, important principles um, that we need to meet. And the most important one of these is that we shouldn't jeopardize our security of supply. That means that um, LNG is globally tradable um, commodity. And uh, not only European companies and households do need gas, but, uh, but uh, there is a um, significant demand also from Asian side and that means that our cap cannot uh, create a situation where cargos will be rerouted and they will uh, head towards uh, Asian markets so um, we will need all the available LNG shipments mm. to replace uh, the volumes that uh, Gazprom is not delivering despite the fact that they do have existing long-term contracts with several uh, companies across Europe. So they are not uh, respecting long-term contracts and uh, that means that we have to find alternatives. Um, but price-wise, uh, this dynamic cap for sure helps us to avoid uh, this unwanted uh, volatility. You mentioned liquefied natural gas. Uh, according to the EU Commission report on the state of the energy union, which was published in late October, LNG now accounts for 32% of EU total net gas imports. By the way, that's a lot more than what the EU generates from solar and wind. So LNG really seems to be uh, the, uh, the big uh, growth industry, if I could say that. Um, is that going to be your priority in the next few months to expand LNG sources and supply? We have done a lot already and uh, since the war started until the end of September, this is the latest data I do have right now, we have attracted plus 28.5 billion cubic metres of additional LNG volumes. But we have also uh, managed to um, negotiate with our trusted partners with whom we do have pipeline connection, Norway, Algeria and Azerbaijan. And uh, they have also increased their volume significantly. So we have received also 24 billion cubic metres of uh, gas via pipelines. And, uh, and this has helped us uh, to fill our underground gas storage. But of course, um, we need also to prioritise uh, savings, energy savings and the fuel switch. So where we can replace natural gas with electricity or with renewable gases, we should do so. And that means that my biggest priority will be um, supporting national governments uh, in their work to accelerate green transition. Let's talk a bit about that clean transition because we are being broadcast during the uh, COP27 talks in Egypt after all, Commissioner Simpson. Uh, what do you think are the most important things that uh, the European Union can do uh, to secure that clean transition? I know that you've uh, been a proponent of carbon capture and the green hydrogen market particularly. Indeed, um, we are negotiating with our member states how to decarbonize our gas market, how to well um, replace fossil fuels with renewables. And uh, most of these renewables will be homegrown, so produced here, but, uh, but we need also global partnerships. And, uh, and also at the margins of COP, we do plan to sign first ever uh, memorandum of uh, cooperation on the sector of uh, green hydrogen with, uh, with host, uh, host country, uh, Egypt. Um, but uh, hydrogen uh, priority corridors um, are very prominently present in our future investment plans too. And we are naming three priority corridors inside Europe, Iberian Peninsula, North Sea and also Ukraine. And then on top of that, uh, these international corporations with our neighbours and, uh, and trading partners. And now, um, you asked also yeah, about, about our plans. 
For, for carbon capture, yeah, if you could just briefly outline that for us, because we don't have much time. But j just to, to explain for our viewers, without increasing carbon capture, it's going to be impossible for the EU to keep to its own commitments in uh, terms of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Indeed, and uh, carbon capture and usage is a, um, a um, strategy that is needed to, um, to meet the 1.5 degree uh, objective. We have financed uh, already some of the promising projects uh, under the Innovation Fund and we will uh, launch next call so that uh, our um, industry can, uh, can receive additional financing so that they can uh, capture the CO2 and store it um, either in, uh, in depleted gas fields or well ship it uh, via ships uh, to Norway, where the long ship uh, project is an uh, advanced project uh, that could help also in this regard. Okay, I think we'll have to end it there. Thank you so much for being my guest on Talking Europe, Kadri Simpson, EU Energy Commissioner, joining me from Brussels. That's all for one for part one of the show in part two i'll be bringing you a debate with two meps at the european parliament that's coming up in a few minutes